we have one color, right? Well, there are lots of choices about hue, about chroma, about luminance. Frankly, there are myriad choices for shape, line, frame. Something that tries to be one thing is never just one thing. It will always shift and jump around under our eyes. Many of the observers would feel this effect of the paint coming off and getting closer and closer and closer to them. Had a sort of bodily and oral response as well and had fits of coughing out their ears. These shots were not actually taken in Midwestern America. These shots were taken over the uh, border in Ontario in a town called Listool, which isn't particularly Midwestern. I mean, we've got one field and abrasive silos. I'd recognize Franny's work anywhere. Francine Gelbreister was from uh, the Midwest in the US and she was a photographer. And these are landscapes. So I guess this is Midwestern American landscape photography. Here he is getting uh, very close and, and intimate with what I believe would have been a hermit crab uh, that he had identified on the beach and he's invoking its form and if you return to the uh, the first poster in our series uh, the Thorold gallery exhibition of Soldostrom's geometric paintings from 66 you'll note a definite homology between uh, several of the ligatures with his magnificent uh, bodily flings, the Go Limp Manifesto, opposite ends of, a, of the same cline. The roll neck turtleneck that Olaf sported that day uh, set quite a fashion in London uh, for that spring and summer that followed. Moving on, three quarters water, one quarter land and sky. This is an inversion of the predominant uh, socio-political understanding of the Great Lakes and their role in the social-cultural matrix. Uh, in the early 1970s, there was a regatta of small boats that got out onto the lakes and they would paddle out as far as they could. Being artists, they couldn't necessarily go too far out. Look, it's the water that's important, not us standing here isolated on the shore staring at each other. America itself had its own performance artists and one of the earliest and most influential was definitely had to be Al Hampton. It's wonderful to see the documentation of Al's performance that day again, despite how things turned out for him in the end. We were invited over to his uh, suburban home, nice pool at Al's, and actually he had the Bobcat poolside during the performances we all thought we were there simply for interviews the shot that we have in the poster that Fitzy got she was a wonderful photographer and had uh, had bravely gone out on the pool on a on a little floating um, mattress you know looking at this poster I'm reminded and I see a real echo of the go limp manifesto over the years I've heard rumblings about a pernicious influence uh, that the Waldron way has over the Thorold gallery I don't think that that is actually the case. I think if anything, there has been a, a productive uh, two-way influence that goes on between these two institutions. This uh, image of Dr. Adonisia comes from his uh, famous uh, Trobriand Islanders uh, lecture in which he argued that all of human communication really was changing matrices on our faces. Several of the artists connected with uh, the Thorold pushed back thinking this was uh, bloody stupid nonsense. Um, and so the debate continues. Every day, every waking moment for Lord Thorold was a performance. And that performance began in uh, 1947 following the war and ended in 1972 on his death. And, you know, people, didn't clap at the end, but it, it was a very long and very convincing performance of a eccentric British aristocrat, Lord Thorold. Gautron is an interesting person in a certain way, precisely because he wasn't a very interesting composer. He was somebody who followed along very much in the, the modes and fashions of the avant-garde from integral serialism through polystylistic stuff, textual music, et cetera, et cetera, a little bit of Elia Torres and so on. But at a certain point, it really sort of seemed like Gautron had kind of understood 
that he himself was a little bit of a fake. And what's interesting about these two pieces is that they are both, in a certain way, about being fake. Paraitis is, of course, a form of fool's gold. It's something that school children, when they go on sort of geological trips to the Dorset coastline, what they're looking for is this fool's gold. They get very excited when they find a piece of these things with their little geological hammers and stuff. In a certain sense, what Gautron is talking about here is precisely that his own works are a little bit fake. Somebody we don't usually think about when we think about the history of avant-garde music in Britain at this time. We're probably thinking most of the time about the Manchester School, about people like Peter Maxwell Davis and Alexander Gurr, um, Harrison Burtwistle, that kind of crowd. I mean, Wales is not something we think about that often at all. But Tattersall is an interesting person, a rather long-winded title, a speculative soundscape system interpreting the geological history of Wales. Although I wouldn't go so far as to say this was a joke, the question of the geological history of Wales has always seemed something of a mystery to me. Of course, one could impute certain aspects of cragginess and large mountains, Snowdonia, the Brecon Beacons, all of this kind of thing. She was crying before the event happened. She was crying whilst it was going on. She was crying after it happened. And many years later, when I saw her in Slovenia, she was still crying then. She was not a happy woman, but she did know how to cry in a certain way. And I think what was very interesting about Ina was precisely the fact that she knew she didn't really have much else to bring to the table. And it was interesting that Lord Thorgold also saw the potential in her utterly, utterly limited repertoire of affects. But an important figure, nevertheless, a lot happened at the Thorold Festival in 1975. I think this was part of Lord Thorold's plan to have a small space with a large amount of stuff going on in it. And so one of the things which isn't often talked about with the famous festival that happened was how much people really didn't like being in such close proximity to each other. A particularly notable event that happened at the festival was when the English Chamber Orchestra, a very stuffy um, institution, if ever there were one, were hired to perform Dietrich Bacanti's Bottom, a piece which required all members of the English Chamber Orchestra to be completely topless. What tended to predominate at this time was a certain sense of not the heroics of the urban space, but the grim grind of the awful domestic sphere. And many of the instruments used here were to kind of give a sense of that abject, worn down quality. An egg beater, right? Um, an old mangle that could be used to sort of dry your clothes. And the effect was nothing of the kind of bold, um, sort of, as I say, kind of industrial primitivism that you find with the futurists. It had a quality more like a rainy afternoon in a cafe where you were having a fry-up breakfast and a rather over-brewed cup of tea. Octavio Maganino's apparitions is a hilarious joke because, of course, he never turned up. He didn't appear. And so these photographs were actually pictures that somebody took of Octavio himself in his own apartment in Italy. And there was something about this to some people who turned up, found this to be a little bit annoying. I guess in many ways, it's a little bit like the visual version of Cage's famous four minutes and 33 seconds, where the pianist sits down, raises their hands in order to play, and then just sits there for four minutes and 33 seconds and nothing happens. One feels that apparitions could, rather like the Cage piece, only happen once because the joke can't be repeated. The Sculpture Park Garden piece, Worm City from 1977, huge inflatable worms, an attempt at a kind of horrific surrealism, sausage meat that had escaped from their skins, spewing all over the large sculpture garden of the Thorold Gallery. The poster is one of the most jolly posters that was produced by the Thorold Gallery. It has a bright, vivacious green and a wonderful, slightly LA SD pink. What could be more magnificent? What could be more awesome than huge pink worms crawling all over the Thorold Gallery, all over the developing history at that time? It's a deceptively simple title, really. Music at the Thorold Gallery. A simple mid-century modern image. 
and then some dates, rather undersells itself for what was really going on in the gallery at this time. Even the concept of saying that music was what was happening here would be slightly questionable. Taking, for example, soundscape composition and turning it into a kitchen sink drama, taking integral serialism and turning it into a revolt by Welsh separatists. Music at the Thorold Gallery was anything but simply music at the Thorold Gallery.